A few years ago, uh, there was a very weird incident that happened. Um, a bunch of people from Facebook had started to get, you know, these little chatbots? There's these chatbots where you can talk to each other, right? So they'd got, they developed a couple of chatbots and then they got them to talk to each other. And then the chatbots started to, to develop the way that they were talking to each other and it began to look really, really strange. It started off with English, well, it had English words, but actually then the grammar of it all changed and the chatbots were not really using English sentences. And at some point, the developers, the researchers in Facebook were like, oh, what is this? This doesn't look anything like English. But interestingly enough, the chatbots were still doing what the researchers wanted them to do. So what the researchers wanted them to do was to negotiate. So um, they, wanted to, they were really interested in seeing if they could get a system where a chatbot would be able to negotiate with a human, right? So the way they wanted to do this was they, uh, they essentially got a zillion, they got loads and loads of humans to negotiate with each other about something silly like, you know, I want three balls and you want two boxes. And they have to kind of figure out a way of, of satisfying each other's needs through a conversation. And then they, they recorded all of those and then they fed that data into the chatbots. And then they got the chatbots then to start talking to each other. And the, the plan for the chatbots was win the negotiation, get the best negotiation, right? And, uh, and as I said, what happened is the chatbots went a bit crazy and the researchers were like, ah, that doesn't really look very much like English at all. And so, uh, so they turned off the program. Now, it was kind of amusing in the press at the time because, uh, because what happened was the press went crazy. You can imagine, oh my God, these AIs, they're going to like take over the world. They're creating their own language and stuff like that. Um, that wasn't really what was happening, or it sort of was what was happening. They were creating their own way of communicating. But I mean, it wasn't so much that the researchers were worried that the chatbots were going to take over the world. It was that, you know, they hadn't really asked the chatbots to keep to English. They'd asked them to win the negotiating strategy. And then they redid this and they got the chatbots to kind of speak more like English again, right? But it was a very interesting experiment because it raised two interesting questions. One of which is, what would happen if we just if AIs became so good at language that they could just communicate with each other using language? And would that leave us behind? In some sense, would, would they just get so good at it, they would just leave us behind? Uh, so that's the question I want to address. I mean, can it be the case that the uh, AIs, artificial intelligences like Alexa or Siri or whatever, can they be as good at language as we are? And moreover, will they do it in the same way as we do? Will they be using language like human beings are using language? Uh, and the answer I'm going to give is they could get pretty damned good at it. They could get really as good at it as, as us or better or whatever, whatever that means. But they would be doing it in quite a different way. So um, if we look back at the history of how, uh, of how artificial intelligences have dealt with language, um, if we look back to the 70s, which is when this really started to happen, uh, AI engineers really interested in whether they could get AIs to talk to human beings, like the computer on Star Trek or whatever. And, uh, and so people started building systems. And the most famous one was called, had the really weird name of Sherdlu. And it was a system uh, that was built by Terry Winograd. Um, and it was attempt, it was just a very simple system where you had a world. The world consisted of blocks, colored blocks of different sizes and the program knew the world and then you could interact with the program and you could say to it something like, put the blue block on the red block or whatever. And then the system would say, I have put the blue block on the red block and it would work like that. And uh, to make that system worked, work, what Winograd did was he took everything he knew about the grammar of English and turned it into sort of computerized rules and then he connected those rules with the meaning of the various words and the meanings of the way the words were put together in this little world of blocks and stuff. And then he used that to build this program. It was quite an incredible piece of work, actually. Uh, and you could, you could get the program to do stuff. It was a bit like Star Trek, but it was just this world of blocks. That's not really very helpful, right? I mean, blocks is not great. Uh, so the question was, could you take something like Sherdlu and expand that and make it, make it completely general, make it work like a human being works, right? So uh, that's what people tried. 
People tried that all through the 70s and 80s, and it's really difficult. It's really difficult because you never know what human beings are about to talk about. <laughs> human beings talk about all sorts of stuff, and they talk about things that are not present in front of them, they talk about things that are in their imaginations, uh, and, you know, I mean, to get a computer program to do that, it's just incredibly difficult. Um, so what people did during the 70s and 80s um, was they attempted to get the grammar better. Bigger sets of rules connected to bigger domains uh, and in fact the, they started to, uh, they computerized that effect as well. So they would get loads and loads of text and they get hundreds of graduate students in linguistics to analyze all the texts and then they'd get a computer program to trawl through all the text and extract the rules and then they use those rules to build another computer program to try and understand the language and that's basically what people did in the 80s. People are still doing it and these gigantic collections of, of sentences, analyzed sentences, are called tree banks and they're still very very useful but it, it never really worked because of this same problem. You never know what people are going to talk about things just break, basically. These, these systems are very fragile uh, and so they don't work like humans work um, or they don't, they're not as flexible as we humans are. So, so something happened in the 80s though uh, that has created a new artificial intelligence that does things in a very different way and that's what surrounds us right now. If we look at Alexa or Siri or, uh, or Hey Google or whatever, they're all using this new system and it's a system that works in a very different way. What you don't do is you, you don't try and work out what the rules are in these systems. What you do is you get the system to be very, very general and very good at analysing whatever you throw at it. <clears throat> and these, these systems are called neural nets. And uh, essentially what you do is you feed the system some data and you tell it what output you want, right? and then you just let it go <laughs> and it just churns and churns and churns and churns trying to match the data it's got to the output that you want effectively okay and once it's churned a lot you've got a new system you've got a system that's sort of structured in a way that will give you the output that you want for the data that you give it and that's that's how most ai systems work these days and they're really quite brilliant so if you look at you know if you say to uh something um, like an AI like Siri and you say, oh Siri, play me uh, Rachmaninoff, um, then Siri will probably play you some Rachmaninoff, right? Um, or Alexa or whatever. So, um, and they do that essentially by using these neural net systems. It's quite interesting because what you, they really do, it's not very much like a human being at all. I mean, what we do when I say play Rachmaninoff is you, it goes into your brain and you just work out what it means and you go and get a Rachmaninoff uh, record or something. What these systems do is they, they hear what you're saying, they parse it statistically using these neural nets and they do that by sending it off across the internet using, you know, to Apple or Google servers in Ireland or in California or wherever they are and then they get all of that data and then they spit it back to you. So it's like, it's like a global intelligence, really, which is quite fascinating. So they manage all that sound, and that works really well, but then they've got to manage the grammar. They've got to manage, they've got to figure out what you mean by saying, Siri, play me some Rachmaninoff, and they're pretty bad at that. All they essentially do is they, they kind of just make a good guess by looking at what is most probable for what those words mean, right? So the kind of task that you have looking across the whole of the internet, what's the most probable likelihood that, you know, those, that those tasks will mean play Rachmaninoff or something, okay? All you're doing is just taking the various words and putting them together. It's like you've got a soup of the words, you're stirring them all around and you're just making the best guess. That's like the semantic soup strategy it's called sometimes. You're using keywords. So that's not how humans do it, right? Um, but there's been new systems. So I don't know if you, uh, uh, well, so just quite recently, couple of years back, um, Google started to use a different approach and it was using it mainly in Google Translate but it's now being used everywhere and what that approach does is it doesn't just use keywords to work out what's going on. What it does is it uses not just the likelihood of what's going to happen when you've got a bunch of words together but actually which word is most likely to follow or precede the next word. So if I say to you something like you know the cat sat on the you're probably going to say Matt because you've heard that a thousand times. 
But I've, if I say the cat sat on the cloud, that's a bit more unusual. If I say the cat sat on the independence, that's really unusual. And if I say the cat sat on the the, you're like, what? Right? These are all sentences of English. You can work out what they might mean. You can imagine for the last one, there's, there's you know, a big book and it's got words in it and the cat sat on the the, right? Perfectly reasonable. Um, so, but, but the cat sat on the the is really rare. It's not going to happen very much. Whereas the cat sat on the mat, the word mat after the is really common, right? Um, so you can use how commonly certain words follow other words to make a good guess as to what the grammar of the sentence is going to be. Uh, and that's what these new systems do. So if you notice Google Translate getting better in the last few years, it's because it started to pay attention to this particular idea um, that, that you can look at the, the statistical likelihood of one word following another. Now there's really sophisticated uh, versions of this now. Uh, they're, they're called long-term, short-term memory neural nets. And what they do is they kind of keep a memory of what they've already heard as well. Right? So in my example, the cat sat on the mat, they'll remember cat and they'll think that mats are pretty likely places for cats to be. So, you, so essentially what happens is that they've got a sort of memory and you can use that essentially to make the grammar work. So let's take an example like uh, the foxes in my greenhouse are jumping around. If you think about foxes and then are, are quite far away from each other, right? The foxes in my greenhouse are. But the, the noun that's right next to R is greenhouse. And you don't say the foxes in my greenhouse is, you say R, because it's foxes you're talking about, not greenhouses, right? And that's always been really difficult for these neural nets, but these new sophisticated ones, they can get that. They can figure out what the most likely verb to agree with the noun is and so on. Um, okay, I'm gonna finish by just saying, wow, that looks incredible, but it turns out that actually these neural nets can't do what, don't do this in the same way that we do. So people have done experiments, so there's a researcher called Tal Linson who's done experiments on these sophisticated neural nets, treating them as though they're humans and getting them to sort of do tasks with language. And at the same time you get humans to do the tasks with language. And both the nets and the humans make mistakes, but the mistakes that the nets make, the neural nets make, are really quite different from the mistakes that the humans make. So even though their performance and their outward behaviour is very, very similar. Actually, what's going on deep down for both of them is quite different. So it turns out that even though neural nets, the kind of AIs we have just now can be absolutely brilliant at language, what they're doing is something quite different from what we human beings are doing with language.